the Davidson County Chancery Court is now in session. All persons having business before the court draw near, give attention, and you shall be heard. God save the United States in this honorable court. You all may be seated. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all um, for being here today and um, for enduring um, with me on the delayed time. I appreciate it. So we are here today on case number 2301, sorry, 231311, Metro Government versus Lee et al. We're here on a motion for temporary injunction, and I have the honor of serving today um, with some of my colleagues from both uh, the east portion of Tennessee and the west portion of Tennessee. So um, I am going to introduce them. I will introduce myself. I am Chancellor Aisha Miles. This uh, case was assigned to me. Um, this is my courtroom. We're happy to host you all here today. And to my left, we have Judge Mark Ward. Judge Mark Ward serves as a senior judge in Memphis, and we are so delighted to have him with us today on this case. To my right, we have Judge Gass. Judge Gass serves in Sevierville. Isn't that right? Judge Gass? That's correct. Yes, and so we are delighted to have Judge Gass here with us today. So typically these cases are done in the lower level of uh, this courtroom or this court building. However, my predecessor had cases in here and you know, we all sit equal. All of us are going to hear this as a panel. We are all together. All of our weight is equal. Um, this ruling will come by a majority rule. So much like when you're at the Court of Appeals, um, all of the judges are sitting, they all have equal weight, and they all come to a consensus on what the ruling will be. And if there is a dissent, there is a dissent. This will happen just like that. Um, we are in my courtroom again. Chancellor Lyle had uh, hearings in here. And the sound is better, and the lighting is better. And this is just where we're going to be today, okay? All right. <clears throat> so before we get started in hearing the proof, um, what I would like to have is have the attorney step to the podium. And if you all could tell us who is going to be speaking, um, introduce yourselves. That way, if we have questions for you, we are able to address you all um, appropriately. May it please the court, and good morning, your honors. I am Wally Dietz. I am the law director for the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County, and in that capacity, I'd like to welcome our visiting judges to our uh, courthouse today. I uh, appreciate your presence, and I would like to also introduce my team. With me from Metro Legal is Michael Doan, and in the middle of this table is Bob Cooper, um, with Bassberry and Sims, and Melissa Roberge, who is with Metro Legal. Uh, with the court's permission, uh, we would like to divide our argument so that Mr. Cooper handles one part and Ms. Roberge handles the second part. Okay, so Mr. Cooper will go first, is that correct? Yes, yes, All right, and then Ms. Roberge second. Correct. Okay, um, fellow judges, are we in agreement that that is appropriate? All right, we look to hear from, look forward to hearing from Mr. Cooper and Ms. Roberge today. Thank you, Mr. Dietz. Thank you, Ron. Good morning, Your Honors. I'm Mary Elizabeth McCullis from the Attorney General's Office, and I am representing Governor Lee and Speakers McNally and Sexton. And at council table with me is Kimberly Nivens and Laura Wyatt. Right. And uh, unfortunately, I'll be taking the, the whole load today. <laughs> okay. So it'll just be me speaking. And it's Ms. McCullis, McCullis. correct? Yes, All right. I just want to make sure that I have the um, pronunciation. Thank correct. you. All right, Ms. McCullis, thank you for introducing your team. Thank it you. is nice to see all of you, and we look forward to hearing from the state as well. All right. 
So before we get started, I do want to set the parameters. This is a motion for temporary, and judge, temporary injunction. We have not um, been asked to have a full hearing. Um, you know, sometimes you can combine motions for temporary injunctions with a final hearing. However, that request was not made um, to this panel today, and so we will just be hearing the motion for temporary injunction. What we will do is we will take um, the ruling under advisement and we will go and we will discuss and we will issue a ruling on the papers. Um, it will not take uh, very, well, tremendously long, um, but we will not rule from the bench today. Um, so I just want to set everyone's expectation. Um, we will keep you all waiting um, a bit on our um, ruling. Depending on what the ruling is, what I would like is if there is a further scheduling order that council work together to set that final hearing and draft a scheduling order that works with you all to submit to the panel. And if we are okay with the dates, we will sign that. If you all are unable to come to a scheduling order and a schedule for the remaining portions of this case, then we will put down an order for you, but we feel that it is better for you all to work together on a schedule that works for you versus having one dictated um, by us. Okay? All right. Um, fellow judges, Judge Ward, Judge Gass, are we ready? Sure, ready. Okay, um, one last thing, we may interrupt you with questions, but you all are very familiar with appellate practice and just kind of how it works in Chancery Court, so I'm sure um, you all will be prepared to answer our questions. We will do our best not to interrupt, but before something leaves our mind, um, we may uh, cut you off. Um, so, but just be prepared for that. All right, Mr. Cooper. May it please the court, Bob Cooper of the Nashville Bar here on behalf of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County on its motion for a temporary injunction. Uh, the way that uh, Ms. Roberge and I will be splitting this is I will address uh, the claims brought by uh, Metro under the Home Rule Amendment. Uh, Ms. Roberge will address the claims under the Equal Protection Clause uh, as well as the other factors to be considered other than likelihood of success of the merits. She'll address the other factors under a temporary injunction motion. Your honors, local governments stopped being mere creatures of the legislature subject to its whim in 1953 when Tennessee adopted the Home Rule Amendment. But the National Sports Authority Act, public chapter 410, seeks to turn back the clock if this court does not enjoin the act, one month from now on New Year's Day, the act will vacate, that is, that is the act's term, the act will vacate the current Nashville Sports Authority Board of Directors and significantly reduce Nashville's future appointments to that board. Nashville will be the only place where this happens. The act will not affect any other city or county on January 1st or on any other time based on any rational or pragmatic reading of this statute. The act's a textbook example of an incursion on local sovereignty protected by the Home Rule Amendment. This is not the only bill that the General Assembly passed this year that is aimed solely at Nashville. Other three judge panels have unanimously enjoined bills that targeted the composition of the Nashville Airport Authority the size of the Metro Council, and the use by Metro of its land at the Nashville Fairgrounds. Uh, we think that Nashville's likelihood of success today will be similarly high as in those other cases. Now, a little bit of background. Nashville created the Nashville Sports Authority in 1995 so that the city could build a football stadium for the Tennessee Titans. And Nashville did this using the 1993 Sports Authority Act, which is an act of general application 
that empowers any city or county to create a sports authority. Nashville's sports authority today is ably guided by 13 local directors appointed by the mayor, confirmed by the council, who are serving staggered terms through February of 2028. Now, the General Assembly seeks to change all of that just for Nashville, which brings us to the Home Rule Amendment. The Home Rule Amendment was passed in 1953 to curtail abuses of the General Assembly's power over local governments. It does this by giving cities and counties their own source of power and protection under the state constitution. That's what the Tennessee Supreme Court said in the Southern Constructors case. However, the Home Rule Amendment applies only to local bills. So let me turn to that. According to the Supreme Court in the Ferris case, a bill is not local under the Home Rule Amendment if it is, quote, potentially applicable throughout the state. But to make this determination, a court, quote, must apply reasonable, rational, and pragmatic rules of interpretation, not, quote, theoretical, illusory, or merely possible considerations. But, Mr. Cooper, can we get to the heart of the matter? I'm going to sure. open it up with the first question. If there was a lot of talk about the scheduling and the deadline in this case. If this court were to bifurcate and remove that section, couldn't this act potentially apply to other counties? There are five other sports authorities, isn't that correct? Uh, six, I believe. Six? Okay. Yes. Well, Nashville is not the only one. Correct. Isn't that right? So if we remove, let's say we find a portion of the um, act unconstitutional as far as the dates are concerned. Aren't there other counties that could meet the threshold as far as the census, could meet the, the layering, the threshold? Couldn't they um, have a sports authority? And if we just remove the deadline, couldn't this act be applicable to those other authorities and other counties? Well, first, Your Honor, uh, for the court to rewrite the statute, which is essentially what the court would be doing in such a situation, uh, is not consistent with the intent of the legislature. The legislative intent here was that this applies solely to Nashville. That is what you see, first of all, in the statement of the sponsors of the two bills, how they presented it to the legislature. But also, Your Honor, I mean, those deadlines are, an, are a, you know, inextricably intertwined with this statute. Um, if, you, uh, you know, if you look at other parts of the, of the general act, uh, the legislature clearly knows how to draft a bill that has generic staggering uh, provisions. In fact, if you look at section 108A2, uh, that section provides that uh, for the creation of a new, of how to create a new sports authority board and to do it in staggered terms, but does not use, does not rely on specific dates. So the legislature knew how to do this in a generic manner if it wanted to do that. But the point is, it did not want to do that. That this bill was designed and intended specifically to apply only to one jurisdiction now and in the future. Um, Your Honor, there is really only one county that even theoretically could meet uh, these, uh, uh, these, all the requirements of the act. And as you said, the act is multi-layered. You, know, you first have to have a sports authority. You have to have a consolidated form of government. You have to have a population of over 500,000 according to the census in 2020 or later. Um, I mean, those by themselves are a multi-layer set of requirements that narrow this down just to one county and that is Nashville. Uh, and in fact, and I'll come to this in a minute, uh, uh, the same requirements were put in the act that uh, was going, that would have vacated and reconstituted the Metro Nashville Airport Authority. And there, the, in the uh, trial court's uh, unanimous opinion, three judge panel, said that those layers by themselves would have been sufficient to show that this was, in, this was intended and limited in any practical sense, only to Nashville. Um, 
but uh, you, have the, you also have the timing deadlines. Shelby County comes closest to you know, being able to qualify for uh, under this statute because you know they have a source authority, a joint authority between the city and the county, uh, and Shelby County has more than 500,000 residents in its uh, you know, uh, in its county, but they are not a consolidated government, and it is not reasonable or practical to think that Memphis and Shelby County will consolidate between now and when the governor is required to have made his first appointment to this new board by June 30, 2025. That's 19 months. And that is to complete a process that is neither quick nor easy. In fact, Memphis and Shelby County have tried at least three times to consolidate since that option became available, and it has failed every time. So particularly, why would they hurry now when the result of that would simply be to forfeit six seats on their current sports authority. So, Shelby, and then finally, let's say they did all that and qualified under this act. Well, even if they did that, a bill that applies to only two counties uh, still does not, is still a local bill under the Home Rule Amendment. And that is the holding in Leach versus Wayne County Tennessee Supreme Court case from 1979, where a bill that applied to only two counties, uh, or the provision, a part of a bill that applied to only two counties, was struck down under the Home Rule Amendment. But, you know, Your Honor, uh, uh, I guess I'd also point out there is no severability clause in this bill. Um, and that, uh, I think, is another important point here. There's no indication. That the, that the legislature would have passed this bill if it had been written in any other manner than the way that it was specifically drafted and passed. Mr. Cooper, let me ask you a question. Yes. Um, assuming that some county meets all of these qualifying criteria, let's say in the year 2032, um, what will the terms of the board members be? Well, that's, a, that's an excellent question because the the bill is silent on that because you cannot meet the, the, the very specific timetable that they set up to stagger terms. Um, think about it. First, the act requires that the newly constituted board goes back to June 30 of 2023 to reappoint the, quote, seven longest standing board members of the vacated board as of that date for the remainder of their terms. So you're saying, what if they met the population requirement in the 2030 census and then consolidated after that? They would be going back uh, you know, more than you know, seven, nine years under your uh, example to bring back the people who were on the board as of June 30, 2023. Uh, yeah, think, but, but think about this to truly be potentially applicable then that it also needs to work in, after the 2040 census or after the 2050 census. How long in all of those will have to go back to June 30, 2023 to find those board members and put them back on the board? Your Honor, unless they have a time machine, that's just not going to work. Um, and then, of course, same thing with regard to uh, the appointees by the governor and by the two speakers. The governor's uh, appointees will serve initial terms that expire on June 30, 2025. That is, of course, impossible to do if, you know, they, if the jurisdiction is not falling within the act until 2032. Likewise, for the speakers whose appointees' terms end on, in 2027 are the House speakers' terms in 2029. Again, you can't do that unless you have a time machine. But this was intentional. And uh, Ferris, and so that's what you really have to look at here, um, that you know, the point of this was, as the sponsor said, the state is putting you know, $500 million into, a bomb, into uh, construction of a new stadium, providing you know, uh, uh, tax advantages. Um, with regard to this new stadium. 
they were particularly targeting. So this bill would not have been passed if it were not intended just to cover Nashville. Um, so again, if the, if the General Assembly had wanted a bill of general application, it would have written it that way. But that was not their intent. And let's look at what, uh, if I could, uh, the, uh, this very same question was presented to the three-judge panel, panel uh, in this court uh, with regard to legislation passed by the General Assembly again this year with regard to the Metro National Airport Authority. Uh, in that case, the General Assembly passed an act that vacated and reconstituted the current authority board. And just like the, just like the bill before you today, that airport bill only applied in counties with consolidated government and a population of over 500,000. And just like the bill you have today, the airport bill said that the initial terms of the state appointees to the new board would expire on June 30, 2025, 2027, and 2029. The state again said this is a bill of general application, but the three judge panel said no. Uh, they applied a pragmatic, reasonable analysis to the language and said that the bill was local because, quote, the conditions to which the act applies are so unusual and particular and precisely fitted that only by the most singular coincidence could it be fitted to any other county, close quote. Uh, and then a three-judge panel uh, in the Metro Council reduction case reached the same unanimous conclusion, again based on an act that used specific dates that would apply only to Nashville. So, Your Honors, we would suggest that, uh, that you should reach the same conclusion here, that this is a bill of local application only. So, uh, let's talk about the other elements, uh, the specific elements of a Home Rule Amendment claim. The first Home Rule Amendment claim is that the 2023 Act is invalid because it lacks local approval. To succeed on that, on that claim, Metro Nashville must show the following, that the Act is private or local in form or effect, which I, I think we have done, that the Act is applicable to a particular county or city, and that the act is applicable to that county or city in its governmental or proprietary capacity. Now, to be applicable, the Supreme Court has said that the act must, quote, regulate or, quote, govern uh, Nashville's conduct, and further said that to regulate means to exercise power over something by adjusting its activities. Well, the Sports Authority Act here adjusts the activities of the mayor of Nashville and the Nashville Council. It repeals their appointments of all 13 current members of the Sports Authority. Those are people appointed by the mayor and confirmed by the council. It then reduces the mayor's appointment power in the future to only seven of the 13 board members, and it totally removes the council from the process. Uh, in fact, the mayor and the council have three board vacancies that they can fill before the end of this year. But if they do that, if they do that promptly, those three members will be vacated on January 1st before they can even warm their seats. So the act obviously exercises power over the mayor and the council. And faced with the similar facts, the three-judge panel and the airport authority case found that Metro met this requirement. Then finally, governmental capacity. It is easy to show that this act applies to Nashville in its governmental capacity, which Tennessee law recognizes to be governmental authority that is a state delegated power. Nashville exercised governmental authority under the 1993 Sports Authority Act in creating the Sports Authority and it continues to exercise its governmental authority uh, under that act by appointing directors. So the 2023 act obviously applies to that governmental authority. So we have all the elements of a local legislation, local approval claim here. It's local, it's applicable to Nashville, and it's applicable in the governmental capacity. 
And under the Home Rule Amendment, any bill that meets those three criteria is void unless it provides for local approval. The 2023 Act was not approved by Nashville. It was forced on Nashville, and therefore it is unconstitutional and of no effect. So Nashville's second claim under the Home Rule Amendment is that this act is a prohibited Ripper bill. Now, under the Ripper Clause of the Home Rule Amendment, the General Assembly has no power to adopt a local bill that removes an incumbent from a county or municipal office, abridges that incumbent's term, or changes that incumbent's salary during the term. But, Mr. Cooper, doesn't yes. the state argue that Metro has a standing problem in regards to bringing the Ripper claims because it really should be the board members who would be affected by this bill versus Metro. Can you speak to that? Uh, yes, Your Honor. I mean, that is the argument that the state makes. It's the same argument it has made in the past. But it ignores a fundamental fact. Nashville appointed those 13 directors. And so when the 2023 Act vacates the board, it negates 13 sovereign acts by the Metro Mayor and the Metro Council. Now, and this is an injury to Nashville's local control of local affairs, which the state Supreme Court has said is the interest that the Home Rule Amendment protects. And that's, that was from the uh, voucher case in Metro versus the Tennessee Department of Education. So the three-judge panel, relying on that language, found Ripper Bill standing for Metro Nashville with regard to the Airport Authority Act's removal of the current Airport Authority board members. Uh, we would suggest that that is the correct uh, uh, position to take and that, uh, the, uh, that Metro clearly has standing here to bring the same claim with regard to vacating the current Sports Authority board. So that then leaves the other issue, which is whether a Nashville Sports Authority director is a county officer. Because it has to be a county officer in order to fall within the river bill. In that regard, Mr. Cooper, is there any appellate authority out there that has attempted to define what a county officer is for purposes of this particular constitutional amendment? For purposes of this particular constitutional amendment, no, Your Honor. We have not found any cases that, uh, that answer that question. Uh, with regard to you know, the general question of what is a county officer, uh, the courts have said that this is a very fact-based determination. Uh, but the relevant factors that have been identified by those courts uh, we think are met here. And that is, you know, first, the source authority is a public instrumentality of Nashville uh, under the 1993 Sports Authority Act. Nashville created the authority, and under the 1993 Act, it can dissolve the authority. Uh, the authority's purpose under the 1993 Act is to allow, quote, Well, let me ask you a question. Yes. Under the Act, they can dissolve the authority, but can they remove a board member? Uh, in this case, no. They do not have power to remove a board member. So once you're appointed... You serve a term. You serve for six years, and the, the Metro has no control over that person? Well, um, Metro uh, has no control in the sense that they can remove, but the statute clearly provides for significant interaction between Metro and, and the Sports Authority. For example, uh, Metro does have the authority, for example, to uh, back up uh, bonds issued by the Sports Authority uh, with revenue other than property tax-based revenue. Uh, there are other powers in there where the two entities are clearly going to be cooperating, and in order for that to cooperation to, uh, uh, to work, they are going to have to work together. So while there may not be a, a method to remove them from office, there are clearly other levers of influence that Metro has over the authority. My colleague, Mr. Roberge, has reminded me that while the statute does not include a provision for removing 
the member, a member of the Sports Authority, uh, the Metro Charter does have a provision uh, that would allow for the removal of a member of the authority, uh, and that is by a three-quarters vote of the Metro Council. And, Your Honor, I think we would argue that you know, since the statute is silent on that point, uh, that the Metro Charter uh, provision would be effective. But in any event, that is how Metro, Char Metro, the Metro Charter views the relationship. Um, so, um, the authority's purpose is to allow individual communities like Nashville to prepare comprehensive long-range master plans for sports facilities. That's in Section 102 of the 1993 Act. <clears throat> The directors, of course, are appointed by the mayor and the council, must be duly qualified local voters in Davidson County. Uh, they hold an office, the statute refers to it as an office, for six years, and they use the powers and resources that Nashville transfers to them for Nashville's benefits, uh, and they are reimbursed for expenses. All of these factors are indicia of a director's status as a county official. No, but what about, so the state argues that the directors are basically, this is a public nonprofit corporation, right? Yes. And so the directors just are directing a non, nonprofit. So how do you, if, if we take what the state's argument as true, how do you transcend that to become a public official? Your Honor, uh, we had the same situation with regard to the National Airport Authority. Uh, it is a separate entity that uh, you know, has its own board uh, and uh, has the power to enter into contracts. Right, and isn't, isn't this sports authority also kind of like, it has its own charter, isn't that correct? Its own governing set of documents? It has its own governing documents that were drafted and approved by the Metro Council and cannot be amended without Metro Council approval. So, so the three-judge panel in the airport case rejected this argument, recognizing that the airport authority, while a separate corporate entity still, quote, carries out public governmental functions on behalf of Metro, of Metro as its instrumentality. Um, and if you, and the, the cases cited by, uh, uh, by the state on this, uh, Judge Ward, to go to your point, are not on point. They are apples, uh, they are apples and oranges here, Your Honor. Well, the, the closest case that I could find is this one that both sides have cited, State Exwell Ross versus Fleming. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the closest case that I have found that addressed whether or not a county attorney was a county official uh, for purpose of constitution. And, and they talk it, it, in that case about various criteria that should be utilized. And one of the most important ones was whether or not the, the person was compensated. Um, these are, my understanding, are non-compensated volunteers? They are non-compensated volunteers, but they are statutorily, statutorily entitled to, uh, to their expenses. So, uh, so there is some payment that is provided uh, to... Uh, so what is the benefit of being a board member? What, what benefits do they give of being a board member? Well, they have the opportunity to be uh, participants in one of the kind of, uh, major uh, uh, elements of development and uh, entertainment uh, in Nashville. Uh, they have the opportunity to work with, with members of the council, to work with the executive, to work with sports teams, uh, and same benefit that pretty much anyone has who seeks to fill a public office, uh, to have that opportunity to give back to the community. But, but did we really pass a constitutional amendment to prevent the stripping of volunteers to nonprofit corporations, even though they assist the, the government? Uh, Your Honor, we passed a constitutional amendment uh, to remedy uh, the uh, many abuses of power uh, by the General Assembly. Uh, 
that in fact was the primary purpose of the 1953 Constitutional Convention. There are several amendments that were adopted, but the reason they were there, what motivated uh, the convention being called was this issue of uh, the uh, legislature uh, overstepping bounds and uh, taking advantage of local governments. So, um, so yes, I think yeah, the language there was quite clearly drafted. Uh, you know, it uh, does not refer to local officials who are elected. Uh, it refers to local officials uh, in a general sense. So that could be elected, that could be appointed. Uh, and uh, I think that uh, their purpose was to, um, you know, to, to provide protection, a very broad protection to local government. And we would suggest, Your Honor, that that would include non-paying jobs, uh, non-paying public offices at the local government, uh, as well as uh, paying jobs, because that can be equally disruptive to the operation of local government. Uh, so I don't think they would have drawn that distinction, and clearly don't in, in the language of the, stat, of the constitutional amendment. So, Mr. Cooper, before yes. we leave this this point, seeing as how the the board members are all volunteers, you know, when I look at the and the intent, um, at least from the legislative history and the reason that this was passed, there was a substantial amount of money that was given to Nashville to this board, and the sponsors of the bill were maybe concerned. I I I, I can't speak to their what their presence of mind was when um, they brought this bill forward, but they were, they had a concern that the taxpayers of Tennessee are all contributing, and Nashvilleans are the only ones who have basically a seat at the table. So seeing as how we're talking about volunteers, they want to appoint other volunteers to serve. Why is there such consternation as to spreading the voices of the people who are basically contributing to this nonprofit. No one is getting paid. Or, am I missing that? In the new statute, no one gets paid, correct? It's just the taxpayers, there's a, a broader voice in regards to what happens with taxpayer dollars. Your Honor, if the legislature is concerned about what is happening with taxpayers' dollars, then they would have been made this a bill of general application. There, at the same time that the legislature voted $500 million for uh, a fo new fo football stadium in Nashville, it voted $350 million uh, to renovate the FedEx Forum and the Liberty Bowl in uh, Memphis. The legislature recently uh, voted, and I don't have this number off the top of my head, but multi-million dollars uh, to build a new uh, baseball, minor league baseball stadium in Knox County. Uh, the legislature, however, does, apparently does not feel that uh, you know, the voters of Tennessee need to have state representation on a board in Shelby County or a board in Knox County or a board in any other city uh, that is getting the same financial advantages. Uh, so, Your Honor, I mean, this will, I think, also come up uh, in Mr. Robert's, uh, Robert's discussion of equal protection, uh, but it is hard to accept that at face value when uh, you know, other jurisdictions that have the same, getting the same financial support from the state you know, are not being required to do this. It's an issue, Your Honor, of local sovereignty, of picking on one jurisdiction, uh, uh, which is clearly what the Home Rule Amendment prohibits. So, uh, Your Honor, so before you leave that yes. point, are you suggesting that ha should the legislature draft a, another bill that would be applicable to any sports authority, yeah, and this may go to Ms. Roberge's uh, equal protection argument, we may not be here today, but it's the singling out, you were saying, Mr. Cooper, of Nashville's local authority, that all these other counties, all these other sports authorities are getting money, but they are not getting the same representation, I guess, from taxpayers as Nashville would, would have. Uh, Your Honor, 
The state, of course, can pass bills of general application, and while those might be challenged on some other grounds, they could not be challenged under the Home Rule Amendment. The Home Rule Amendment addresses local bills, but if it is a local bill, which this clearly is, then it falls within the Home Rule Amendment, and it requires, first, that there be local approval of the bill. It cannot be imposed by force. It must be consensual, and there is no requirement of that, and it cannot remove sitting county officers. Um, so, Your Honor, Nashville doesn't like being adverse to the state, but it must protect its sovereignty, which is why we are here today invoking the Home Rule Amendment. The Home Rule Amendment was adopted to prohibit exactly what happened in the General Assembly this spring. Not just the National Sports Authority Act, but the National Council Reduction Act, the National Fairgrounds Act, and the National Airport Authority Act. If the General Assembly can do these things to Nashville, it can do them to any city or county in the state. And that is why this act should be enjoined under the Home Rule Amendment. Mr. Cooper, the uh, speak to again, and I know you have, but I want to make sure I don't miss any other points you may want to make. As it relates to today's hearing and the injunctive relief sought uh, by your client in this case, uh, other than uh, uh, the argument for an irreparable injury because of the deadlines, the, the first of the year and thereafter, uh, it, are there any other factors that would justify, from your client's standpoint, uh, some injunctive relief at this point in the, in the case? I think Mr. Roberts will uh, deal with uh, this point also okay. in, with regard to the injury, but what you have here is a constitutional injury, uh, and I think that is the primary injury that uh, needs to be addressed here, Your Honor, and what makes this, you know, uh, makes the likelihood of success of the merits so important in a temporary injunction matter, that where there is a constitutional injury, and here it is a constitutional injury to Metro's local sovereignty, uh, that that carries, that means that likelihood of success on the merit carries additional weight, uh, even over the other factors uh, under a temporary injunction test. Well, if the court has no other questions for me, then I will turn this over to uh, Ms. Robert. Chancellor. We're going to take a brief pause to make sure that we can um, get like the sun. <laughs> Office with the witness chair. <laughs> So I was told, we'll go off the record briefly, but uh, I was told that if we broke these, we'd have to buy them. So I tend not to bother them, but I under... <laughs> That's good right there. It doesn't have to go all the way down. Oh, the middle one needs to go down. May I? You, of course. We will be a brief recess while we figure the blinds out. And then I think that you can actually close them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want it down further, Judge Ward? Perfect. Perfect. What about the, the two side ones? Oh, no, that's fine. Okay. All right. Ms. Roberge, are you ready? I am. All right, we can go back on the record. Thank you. Good morning, Your Honors. Melissa Roberge on behalf of Metro Nashville. And I'm going to go a little bit out of order to piggyback off of what Mr. Cooper was saying and Judge Gass to answer your question. There is additional irreparable harm here. The Sports Authority is a very significant piece of Metro Nashville. They, op they exercise significant power on our behalf. 
We just issued $750 million worth of bonds to help finance the Titan Stadium. And who's overseeing that? The Nashville Sports Authority. Those board members are acting on behalf of Metro Nashville. And something that the injunction can do is remove any uncertainty about who those board members are, what they're doing, how they're doing it, and when it happens. <clears throat> we saw, and I know we do keep referencing the airport authority case, and it's because it does provide an example of what can happen. There was a back and forth with the airport authority board. The Metro board was in power until June 30th. On July 1st, the state appointed board took power. The court issued the injunction, voided out the state board, and now the Metro board is in power. And there has been, um, if you're not local here to Nashville, it's hard to go a week without there being a newspaper article about the uncertainty. The Nashville taxpayers, the Metro government, doesn't need to endure that uncertainty because this court can issue an injunction. So that's the additional harm that comes from this 2023 act. And not only is it unconstitutional under the Home Rule Amendment, <clears throat> excuse me, it is also unconstitutional under the Equal Protection Clause because there is no rational reason to create a class within the larger sports authority class based on a combination of population and form of government. But this Ms. Roberge, before you move any further, is uncertainty irreparable? Like the uncertainty that the Nashville taxpayer may have, is that irreparable harm or can that be cured? And is it merely transitional should the act be able to take place? Can it be fixed on the back end? Probably, but is there a reason to endure that now? No, like that's one of the reasons that we filed a request for a temporary injunction. Can the pieces get sorted? Yes, but without knowing what those particular pieces will be in January, in February, and in March related to the stadium, it's hard to predict what the consequences will be and how far reaching they'll be. And it, also I'll add that the state has not cited any case where a Tennessee court has recognized sort of this ranking of constitutional harms. A constitutional harm is a constitutional harm and that thumb then goes on the side of establishing irreparable harm if there's a high likelihood of success on the merits. And again, we do have a high likelihood of success here. With regard to the equal protection claim, Metro Nashville has standing to bring this claim. As my colleague explained, we are injured by our, the changes to our appointment power. The state suggests that the proper party to bring this challenge is the sports authority itself. But the sports authority has never appointed a board member, not a single board member ever. Who appoints them? Metro Nashville. So that is the injury that we are alleging and that's what gives us standing to bring our equal protection claim. Because we're being treated differently, you're on to Chancellor Miles, to your point. Metro Nashville doesn't get to appoint all of the board members under the 2023 Act, but Williamson County does, but Memphis does, but Montgomery County does, but Knoxville does. And what's different about Nashville? And I'm gonna use Memphis as a specific example. Both Nashville and Memphis have populations over 500,000. Both Nashville and Memphis have sports authorities. Both Nashville and Memphis have professional sports teams. Both Nashville and Memphis received more than $300 million from the state last year. This isn't about having a seat at the table because there's a lot of tables. This is about having a seat at only Metro Nashville's table. And there's no rational reason for that. Rational basis, parties agree, is the standard that applies here. And that's a very lenient standard, but it's still a bar to clear, and it's not a bar that's cleared here. To find, to find the rational basis, this court can look to the legislative history or to any rationale put forth by the state. And let's start with the legislative history. Chancellor Miles, as you noted, the legislative history is littered with references to the Titan Stadium, to Nashville, to how much money the state is investing here in Nashville. 
What that establishes is that Nashville was targeted. But the state pivots away from that. And why would they do that? Because it, it seems reasonable that they might want a seat at a table when they're investing that kind of money. And the reason they're pivoting away from that is because it's fatal to the Home Rule Amendment claim. You can't pick on a city in that way under the Home Rule Amendment. So they abandon that rationale and try to make it broader and talk about population. They claim that the rationale is that the state has an interest in developing the recreational opportunities in the state for professional and amateur athletic events, which are more prevalent in Tennessee's populous cities. But wait, Tennessee's most populous city is excluded. And why is it excluded? Because of its form of government. And what rationale does the state offer for the form of government classification? None. And what other metropolitan governments are there? What do metropolitan governments have in common that could justify this type of rationale? If you drew a Venn diagram of Metro Nashville and then one of Hartsville and Lynchburg, there would be this itty bitty piece where they overlap. And it's just that they have the same form of government. But other than that, there are no similarities. To quote the Chattanooga uh, Metropolitan Airport Authority, it's not readily apparent why there is a classification based on form of government. Because there isn't a rational basis, the statute fails under the Equal Protection Clause. Pivoting back to irreparable harm, likelihood of success is often the determinative factor. And we know what, we're, what was going on here. The legislature last session targeted Metro Nashville. As Mr. Cooper said, suing the state is a big deal. It's not something that cities undertake lightly. And that makes this case unique. But what also makes it somewhat not unique is we've sued the state four different times because they didn't just attack Nashville generally. They attacked our council, they attacked our charter, and two of our most successful instrumentalities. And so Metro Nashville had to ask the court to hold the constitutional line. And the court held that line in the, in the council case by, by issuing a temporary injunction that wasn't appealed. The, another three-judge panel unanimously held the line again when the state redlined Metro's charter related to the fairgrounds and how we use the land out there. And then another separate three-judge panel held the line again in the airport authority case. We are asking that this court continue to hold the line and issue a temporary injunction, finding that Metro has a high likelihood of success on the merits of all of its claims under the Home Rule Amendment, the Ripper Bill, and the Equal Protection Clauses, and that there will be irreparable harm because of the 2023 Act. If the court has no further questions, we ask that you grant our motion. Thank you. Any further questions, Judge Ward, Judge Gass? Okay. Thank you. Ms. McCullough? Yes, ma'am. Are you ready? Yes, ma'am. Before I get into my formal argument, I'd like to address the questions that have been asked of uh, Metro's counsel, just so I can go ahead and get those off the top of my head. Um, the, I believe the, the first question, um, or one of the first questions, would, was what would be the result of the, um, the board uh, after the qualifying deadlines? And if you take a look at Chapter 410, Towards the end of the uh, chapter, at section C, triple little i, there is a provision allowing for what should happen after the expiration of the deadlines. And it reads that following the expiration of director's terms as prescribed in subdivision A4C, 
little two I. All subsequent terms are for six years to begin on July 1st and terminate on June 30th, six years thereafter. So there is a provision that accommodates what happens as you transition and meet those deadlines for the board members. Next, I'd uh, like to address. But, but, but that doesn't answer my question. If it, the board was, uh, all the criteria were met in March 1st of 2032, what would the terms of the board members be? They would be the six years, but they would also be staggered. If you look back at. Uh, would they all be six years? They would be six years in staggered terms. So when you look back at um, section 108A2, that um, sets forth how an initial board of directors would be set up. So you'd have the two years, then that mirrors what is happening under chapter 410 because the, mayor, the mayor's appointments would come off, would rotate off on 2025 and 2025. Then the second group has a term of four years, and that is mirrored by the um, Speaker of the House appointments that come off in 2027. Then this, the third group has a term of six years initially, and their deadline is 2029. So then you would look at that provision thereafter, so you would still have the staggered six-year terms starting as of those deadlines. But, but it doesn't say that. I mean, where, where are you reading from in the Act? I'm sorry. It's... Um, It's not in the act, it's in the, in the statute, uh, section 108 in the statute. Oh. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I got you confused. Okay, yes, thank you, because I, I was a little. So when you, when you look at the statute at section 108A2, there is the provision for how the initial board of directors are appointed in that staggered system. Are you talking about the one that says June 30th, 2023? No, Your Honor. There's something. You must be somewhere else. So I'm comparing Chapter 410, which is a subsection C, which is added at the end of Section 108. I'm sorry. So if you go at the beginning of 108, you've got that other provision. Okay, so I have the statute pulled up. Yes, ma'am. Where, where are you? Give me... A2. A2. So that's the this, this second paragraph. Okay, when the initial board of directors is appointed, the governing body of the municipality... Is that where, is that where you are? Yes, Your Honor. Okay. Um, shall divide... I mean, you can read it for the court if you'd like. Judge Ward, do you have... No, I don't have it. Okay. Do you have ability to put it up on the Elmo? Certainly, I can use the Elmo here. So this is the, the section right here that's highlighted in pink. Can you make it a little bit larger for the benefit of Judge Gass and Judge Ward? So again, to try and um, visualize how this section is mirrored in uh, subsection C, which is the new section added to 108, that's what's happening. So you have the initial group, which is the mayor appointments. Um, their terms expire at the end of 2025, which would be approximately two, three years later. Then you have the speaker appointments which is the second group, they would expire on 2027, which is approximately four years from now. And then 
the last group is approximately six years from now. And uh, then when, if you move to subsection little i, I think that's where I started. Um, no, are you in the public act? Are you? I'm in, the, in 410 in the public okay. act. Sorry, I don't want to put my copy on the Elmo. It has all my scribbles and highlights. Okay, that's it. That's it. Okay. Thank you. So, small Roman numeral three, right here, uh, which is in the public act. Um, deals with what happens to the terms for the boards of the board of directors uh, after the expiration of those deadlines. So it, it moves in an orderly progress that comports with the statute as a whole. And so are we reading that after the expiration of the deadlines in 2029, everyone else who would be appointed to the or who would come to the board by these different appointments then serve six years? Well, the six years, yes, but they would still be staggered appointments. So you have the first deadline, you have the first group rotating off in 2025. Mm -hmm. So that, then, then you, that. And then there, some, and someone takes their place. Right, right? and that person so that takes the place would serve for six years. Okay, and then go, keep going. Right, right. and then in 2027, the, that group would rotate off and the next, um, so another six years for those people, but you see it's still staggered. I understand, but everyone serves six years. Right, right. And, so and that, the, the yes. difference herein is, is who the board is constituted of now. You know, it's, it's, well, it's more people at, at this point should this law take effect from across the state. Yes, yes. It would include uh, six members from across the state. Uh, with Metro still holding the majority of seven members. Any further questions on that? Judge Wood. Thank you. Um, next, I'd like to address um, the references to prior decisions by other panels. We're here today on this specific statute. We're, we're not here arguing about other rulings, what's happened in other cases, because those statutes are vastly different from this particular statute that governs the sports authority. But isn't this statute similar to the uh, airport authority statute? It, I mean, if we look across the rulings that have happened here recently, we have more of an apples to apples comparison with the Metro Nashville Airport Authority. Is that correct? Not exactly. Okay. And the, the reason being is that the Airport Authority is a very different animal from the Sports Authority. The Sports Authority is a nonprofit <coughs> corporation. So what that means is that once Metro appoints a board member, they don't have control over that board member any longer. This, it's different in the airport authority. I looked at that recently to try and figure out how to distinguish the airport authority statute from the sports authority statute. And some highlights jumped out at me. So the purpose of the Metro Airport Authority Act um, are to, to be, to give the authorities powers that are public and governmental. In other words, they can acquire land for public and governmental purposes. At section 103 of the Airport Authority Act, board members are called commissioners. And to me, that's a distinction as you look through the act. Um, the um, board for the airport authority is adopted by a resolution, and it's not a separate corporation. In other words, it's purely a resolution to create the board 
but the airport authority is not a corporation. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, the board is made up of commissioners. It's not a board of directors as you would have in a corporation. And the commissioners may be removed, this is a significant point, by, appointing, by the appointing authority. So directly in that statute, it allows removal of the commissioners by the appointing authority. But what? Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Judge Gass. Sorry. No, you go Council, ahead. Council, what about the <clears throat> previously mentioned charter provision yes. of the metro government having in its charter the ability that allows their vote to uh, remove a member? Three uh, quarters, I think, is what was said. Yes, yes. Um, that particular provision in the charter um, reads that this, this is a general provision. It's under the general provisions. And it applies to all administrative boards and commissions, which the sports authority is not an administrative board, neither is it a commission. It's a corporation. But, but is it an agency of Metro? Like, it's just not out there doing what it wants of its own volition. It does have a check to Metro, isn't that correct? Or are you, are you suggesting that it just operates on its own no approval by the mayor, council, anything. So Metro truly is separate. Yes, it is truly separate. The Metro Council does not uh, have powers to review what the board is doing and, and uh, weigh in on every single action of the Sports Authority Board. Um, they would have funding authority, however, would they not? Possibly. It depends. The sports authority can, can fund itself. It can issue bonds. It can enter into contracts. It can um, enter into loans. It, it's a separate corporation that, that acts as its own entity. But it does not carry the full faith and credit of Metro government in borrowing money or taxation to pay funds back. Correct. Okay. Correct. Right. So if it's truly its own separate entity, is is it private and thus not a governmental entity and the legislature can't then dictate? Like, which one are we? Because if we're a nonprofit, we're a nonprofit, right? And right. the right. state does not get to meddle in private corporation. If we're a governmental entity, then we're a governmental entity. So which one are we? The Sports Authority is a private corporation. It is a nonprofit private corporation. It is chartered in, in that respect, as opposed to the Airport Authority. It is not chartered as a, as a corporation. It's, it's not at all like the Sports Authority. Um, so then back to my, back to my original, if, if they're private, They have their own governing documents. Correct. They come into court then on a contractual basis with whomever they contract with. Does the legislate, hold on, you <laughs> might want, you might want to, so are you saying that the, legislat the legislative body who just issued a law talking about how to appoint members of the board, they can't do that in a private corporation, right? That's right. That's right. So, so doesn't that undercut your whole argument, or am I missing something? Right? Because you just said, and maybe I didn't hear you correctly, so please clarify with me. Did you just say that the legislature cannot appoint board members? That's what I thought I heard you say. No, no, that's not that. I'm sorry. I must have misunderstood your question. I thought you were asking if the legislature could come into uh, governing the sports authority in certain aspects. But no, the, the legislature can appoint. But if they're a private nonprofit, how? Through this statutory scheme. But can they do that? Yes, yes, yes. OK, so you're going to have to explain that to me, because when we look at nonprofits, generally speaking, they appoint their own boards, their own board of directors. The state doesn't come in and say, nonprofit gavel for a good cause, we're going to tell you who your board of directors is. Right. So how are they, do is, is it because they're lending money and because they're doing tax 
dollars? It, it's because of the, statu the statutory scheme in this instance. It's true that the sports authority is an instrumentality of, of Metro in the sense of it is trying to uh, accommodate Metro's um, desire to um, bring sports teams to Tennessee, but it's also to bring sports teams to all of, t of Tennessee for any, any authority. So under the statutory scheme, the metropolitan entities or a municipality or a county can appoint the board members, but that's where their power stops. It's just the appointment power. That's the only power that's really um, delegated to the municipalities or the counties, and in this instance with Chapter 410, the state. Just the appointment of the board members. And there's an, another aspect of the Airport Authority Act that I think goes to one of the questions about compensation that was made earlier. Under the Airport Authority Act, um, the president of the board is paid a salary by the, the, either the municipality or the, the county that has created the Airport Authority. And the commissioners may adopt civil service plan for their employees. And the authority and a municipality may exchange employees. So there's a very, very different uh, aspect to the airport authority. It does not op operate as its own separate corporate entity. Now, getting back to the, the separateness of the sports authority and the municipality, it's, it's quite clear since 1993 that Nashville has accumulated the majority of the sports teams. We have the Titans, and they play at Nissan Stadium, which is a stadium owned by Metro. The Nashville Predators play at Bridgestone Arena, which is a venue uh, owned by the Sports Authority. So here you have one team has a venue owned by Metro, the other team has a venue owned by the Sports Authority. Then we have the Sounds, which is a joint venture, and that is allowed under the statute. So we have Metro Council, we have the state, and we have the Nashville Sports Authority coming together for the Sounds Stadium. Then uh, the Major League Soccer team, the Nashville so Soccer Club. Um, the stadium was funded by revenue bonds issued by Metro. So there's various ways that the entities can work together to implement the purpose of the statute. Now, the 1983 Act at Section 117, and the reason I'm going back to the entire Act is you can't really assess what's going on with this chapter unless you look at the entire Act. In other words, how does it fit within the statute as a whole? So the Sports Authority can enter into leases, contracts, deeds of conveyance, or any other instruments in writing. And those instruments are executed in the name of the authority. They're not executed in the name of Metro Nashville. Under Section 121 of the Act, and I, when I say the Act, I'm referring to the 1993 Act, to be clear. Now, a municipality may acquire a project site and may transfer ownership 
to the sports authority, but again, it's an interaction between two separate entities. And sections 111 and 116 of the Act, the 1993 Act, allow for the joint ventures that I mentioned earlier. And what that means is that the municipalities and the sports authorities can aid each other and engage in cooperation to implement uh, construction or, or wooing teams here. But that does not mean that one, uh, that the municipality governs the sports authority. But you said earlier, or I, at least I thought I heard, that the council has removal power of the board members. Is that right? There is that general provision, which Charter um, applies to administrative boards and commissions, and the sports authority is not such an animal. So you're saying that once a board member, in essence, gets on the sports authority board, the council can't remove them. No one gets to remove them, and the only way they are removed is the expiration of their term? Yes, so our I, I am assuming, although this is an assumption, that if the board wanted to oust one of their own members, I assume they could do that. But it, the uh, removal would not be from outside the corporation. It, it would be within the corporation. I, I'm not well versed on the actual charter of the sports authority, so I'm assuming that that's possible, but I am not certain. As was uh, discussed by Metro's council, um, this injunction request um, should be viewed um, regarding their, their ability to succeed on the merits. And our position, again, is that the Nashville Sports Authority is the entity that should be here today if they had an issue with how this appointment process is going to begin on January 1st. Because surely the sports authority knows that this is going to happen on, on January 1st, but they are not here today. And time would be of the essence. If they thought that this particular chapter was harming them, they would be here today. Because are you, if this Council, are you claiming that uh, they are an indispensable party to this action? What I'm claiming is that if they felt they were being harmed by this passage and the, the implementation beginning on January 1st, I would assume they would be here. I'm not, I'm not suggesting necessarily that they're an indispensable okay. party because it would be their option whether to come in and seek relief from the court. But aren't we dealing with volunteers, unpaid persons? So if we're talking about whether or not volunteers get to finish out their terms and they are not at, they don't have a seat at the table, can this court make a ruling in regards to a party that's not here that's going to affect them? I mean, I'm just going back to you know, there are rules of civil procedure that says if this court finds that a party is not here and should be here, our, our, it, as our ruling of frankly no effect, if we're here arguing about a party that, that's not represented in, in these proceedings. I understand your, your question. I wouldn't um, venture to, 
to comment on what the, the court should or shouldn't do regarding this, the sports authority. Um, my position or our position, the state's position, is the fact that the sports authority as a corporation can sue, it can bring a, a lawsuit, it can seek relief of this court, and it, it hasn't done so. Um, so I think that speaks volumes as to what their position is in this particular matter. Well, that's an assumption, right? Exactly. Right. It's an so, assumption. Okay. Thank you. So I'd like to now briefly address the, um, the constitutional challenge in the sense of um, we, we've spoken about the, the four factors necessary to warrant a temporary injunction. As, as I stated earlier, um, Metro has to establish um, the third of the four factors, um, which becomes the most important, which is success on the merits. And this court should start with the presumption that Chapter 410 is constitutional. And that means that you start with this strong presumption that Chapter 10 is constitutional. And because Metro has made a facial challenge to 410, Metro must establish that there are no set of circumstances um, under which 410 would be valid. And that's simply not the case. There are clear circumstances under which Chapter 410 retains its constitutional nature, both presently and potentially. And that is because Metro is only appointing board of directors. That's where their power stops. That's the end of their actions regarding the sports authority as far as this particular chapter is concerned. If we look at the question as to whether or not 410 is a ripper bill, it is not, because it does not remove Metro officers from office. When the 1993 Act is read in its entirety, it is clear that the Act emphasizes the separateness of the sports authority from the creating municipality. And this statutory language defines the separateness and reason leads to the conclusion that the Sports Authority board members are not Metro officials. As in any corporation, the Sports Authority board members make decisions that may result in liability for the Sports Authority. They approve contracts. They employ people. And Metro does not direct or govern the decisions of the Sports Authority. Additionally, Metro does not have liability on any contracts that are entered into by the authority. And the Sports Authority board members cannot be Metro employees and cannot be compensated by Metro. Chapter 410 is not a special, local, or private act. That's because it's potentially applicable to counties throughout the state. The uh, Chapter 410 does not infringe on Metro sovereignty and doesn't violate the home rule because the provisions of 410 change the appointment process for counties having a metropolitan government and a population of more than 500,000 as of the 2020 federal census. This will ultimately apply as certain counties grow to that size and form metropolitan governments. It's a, a possible progress. But isn't it, aren't you relying on speculation for this court to basically look into the future and say that, you know, a, a particular county in Tennessee is going to, number one, grow in population, number two, form a metropolitan government. Right now, we have a county that has a metropolitan government and that has, meets the population requirement. So if we're looking at this law today, and today, doesn't it only apply to one county? Yes, that is true. Today it does. 
but potentially it may not. And you cannot rule out the possibility. Um, However, it, wasn't it the Ferris case, I, I believe, that one of the cases, we've read so many, um, so forgive me if I don't recall, but there was a Supreme Court case that talked about basically projecting into the future and how you can't do that. And so the test would not be for this court to look into the future as to what might happen. We have to look at what is happening now. Isn't that right? Sure, a lot of things may happen, but Shelby County is a good example of they meet the census, but they don't have a metropolitan government. And with the trigger date of this law being June 30th, 2023, for when the board members, you know, that the time, the deadlines start to kind of trigger out, aren't we really looking just at one county? Presently you are, but if it is possible for other counties or municipalities or metro governments, it's really going to be metropolitan government, if it's possible for them to come under the purview of the statute, then it's not, it's not unconstitutional because that it, it is a possibility. Of course, the future is always speculative, but it is possible that uh, Memphis and Shelby County may try again to become a metropolitan area. And it's, it's possible that um, Knoxville and Knox County may grow in enough size to meet the qualifications of this, this statute. But even if they do, can they comply with part four that says appointments and reappointments of the directors to the new board of directors must conform to the specific timing deadlines that begin on June 30th, 2023. So even if even if they're able to meet, you know, a city or county that has a sports authority, that they have exceeded the federal census by a threshold of 500,000, um, that they adopt, you know, a metropolitan form of government, aren't we kind of stuck with that June 30th, 2023 deadline? Not necessarily. If you look at, and I'm talking about Section 108, the, um, the early portions of uh, the early sections of Section 108, when you look at A4B, there is a provision for counties having a metropolitan form of government. Um, and it goes into the appointment of the director. So there are other provisions in 108 that could apply initially to the, a metropolitan government. You can continue. So uh, finally, what I would like to say is that Metro has not expressed, has not, uh, has not been able to show an irreparable injury. Metro will still be able to appoint members to the sports authority. They will be able to appoint seven of the 13. So in that sense, they have something going forward. And as I explained earlier, the appointment authority is, is where it stops. That's what this statute is, is targeted on, is the appointment of the board of directors. And so you're saying that they will not be irreparably harmed because they now can appoint 13 and in the future can only appoint seven. That is not an injury that is irreparable to, to Metro. That's what you're saying because yes, they yeah. still can appoint. Yes, yes, sir. That's, if, if there are no further questions, I'll sit down. Thank you. And rebuttal? The appointment power is pretty significant. Before you get started, I need to ask you a question. Yes. So the 
the state has made the argument that the sports authority is not here today. Now, you want us to rule on standing. Help me understand if the sports authority should be an indispensable party and should the, can this court make a ruling if they're not here, if it affects them? Because the state says it doesn't matter. If they wanted to be here, they should have been here. They weren't here, so they don't care. So help me understand that. Absolutely, Your Honor. So a, a couple of points. The Nashville Sports Authority doesn't have appointment power, so they're not injured by this act. They're affected by this act, but they're not injured by it. Um, as to the individual board members, could they also have been a party? Yes, but to your point, they are individuals. They are not an indispensable party. And the injury here, again, is to local sovereignty. The individual board members don't have local sovereignty. Um, and the Home Rule Amendment is applicable to the counties. That's what the vouchers cases tell us. So the proper party is here before you today, and we are asking for relief. The board members and the National Sports Authority are not necessary parties, Your Honor. Okay. And Thank you. the appointment power, it's, again, it's significant. We see it at all levels of government. Federal government has their appointments that they take seriously. State has appointment power that it takes seriously. If the appointment power wasn't significant, why are we even here today? Why would the state want a seat at the table? Because the seat at the table matters. And how many seats you get to appoint, that matters. It is absolutely an injury to lose almost majority control of the sports authority. I want to turn to this point about the airport authority not being a corporation and talk about the similarities between the airport authorities and the sports authorities. They are both public instrumentalities of Metro Nashville. They are both self-funded. So the Metro Nashville Airport, much like the Shelby County Airport and Knoxville Airport, are funded from airport fees and their self-generating revenue just like the sports authority is funded through issuing bonds. The airport, can, airport authority can also issue bonds. Um, both have boards that are appointed by the local government. Both have the ability to lease. Both have the ability to contract. And we're not disagreeing that it's a separate legal entity. But it doesn't completely sever its relationship to its creating municipality, which is Metro Nashville. Also. The president of the board does not receive a salary. I would, uh, for the airport authority, I would direct the court to 42-4-105-F, and that specifically states that the board of commissioners for the airport authority does not receive any compensation. They do receive their expenses, again, just like the airport authority. And the way we, there was also talk of, once we appoint somebody, game over, Metro Nashville's over here. But that is how we weigh in. People are appointed that align with Metro and the council's vision for what sports looks like here in Nashville or what they look like in Memphis or what they look like in Knoxville. It's a pretty significant piece of the puzzle. And what happens after? That's been kind of a, a question that's been swirling around. Um, the public act contains this language notwithstanding this section to the contrary. So how it starts off. So that means A2 that your attention was drawn to, we're not thinking about that, notwithstanding to the contrary. I will also note that A2 gives the power to the local municipality to create these groups for the initial appointments. That's not what 410 does. 410 doesn't give the power to the local municipalities to decide when the governor's appointments expires. It just gives that power to the governor to make those appointments. So A2 is not applicable here now or potentially in the future and does not save the statute. There 
There's also a discussion about if the board of directors are county officials. We would ask this court to look to school board members. And school boards are separate entities from the local government. They have the power to contract. They have many, they have the power to lease buildings. Similar powers to what the sports authority has. And it has been black letter law that school board members are county officials. And we would ask that you find the same. Finally, well, when you say that it was black letter law, but it's not any case dealing with this constitutional provision. That's true, Your Honor. It has been under. Um, so there may be county officials for 1983 liability or workers' comp or whatever, but, but there's not no black letter law dealing with this constitutional provision. Though. That's true, Your Honor. And here, um, we would submit that what makes a county official, like what are the characteristics of a county official? First, that you're doing the county's business. Well, the sports authority is doing the county's business. Before 1993, sports was, and it remains, county business. It just shifted from being Metro Council and the mayor to this public instrumentality that was still a part of Metro Nashville. Second, that they're appointed by, and only appointed by, local officials. Until this 2023 act, that was the case. They were only appointed by local officials. Well, let me ask you something. Is there anywhere else in the Tennessee Constitution that talks about, quote, county officers? There is a um, separate constitutional provision, and I don't have it on the, on the tip of my tongue, but they also have never addressed a public instrumentality that is like the sports authority, where all of the members were appointed by um, the local government. And this is a, bull, a bill of local application. Chancellor Miles, you noted that it's speculation to assume that another metropolitan government will spring up. I'd actually go further and say that it's fantasy. Memphis has tried and failed, tried and failed three different times. And why would they do this now? What's their benefit of consolidating now? Their benefit is that they lose half of their sports authority board? There's no reason that they would consolidate. And we would draw the court's attention to the Board of Shelby case. It is out of the Western District of Tennessee, Judge Mays. And in that case, there were multiple, there was a class created um, by the conditions. And then conditions kept being put on and put on, put on, put on, such that it would be pure coincidence, complete speculation, that they would ever occur except for this one county. That's, that ex that's the exact same situation we have here. And the court found that to be unconstitutional, correct? Like the court was not persuaded, even though it could have. That's the case that I was referring to. Even though theoretically it could happen if we look at it pragmatically. Exactly, which is exactly what the Tennessee Supreme Court tells us to do in Ferris v. Blanton. So that Western District case is just a faithful application of Ferris v. Blanton, and we would ask this court to do the same. One last point on irreparable harm. This Chapter 410 completely removes Metro Council from the process of appointing commissioners. So whereas before they weighed in on all 13, under this act, they weigh in on zero. And that is irreparable to the Metro Council that should have a say in who is on the Sports Authority Board. If there are no further questions, we would ask that you grant our request for a temporary injunction. All right, we don't have any questions. Um, thank you all so much for um, the vigorous discussion today. It was quite enlightening. Um, thank you for your briefing. Um, thank you to the AOC staff um, for helping us facilitate this. As I said earlier, we will confer um, as these three judge panel cases do, much like the Court of Appeals, and we will issue a ruling on the papers. In the interim, you all should work together um, to come up with a schedule um, depending on what may happen with um, our opinion. But, you know, 
It's always nice to plan. Things get, get busy. All right, to the visiting judges, Judge Ward, Judge Gass, it has been a pleasure serving all of you today. Um, thank you. I don't, do you have anything further? No, Judge I appreciate Ward? the arguments. Enjoyed it very much. Judge Gass? I certainly appreciate it as well. Thank you all. All right, so we are adjourned. Um, you all can, um, we're going to leave. All right. <laughs> All right. Thank you.